Barry Hankinson taking millions from me. I remember I had my first big arena tour. LL Cool J was opening up for me, and I could not believe it because I just had started in the game. And LL Cool J was someone I looked up to and had a lot of respect for. And I could not believe that he, LL Cool J, was opening up for me on a major arena tour where there was 40,000 screaming fans. But anyway, Barry Hankerson, my manager at the time, was the one who came to me and told me, congratulations. I just got you a first 35 city arena tour. Then he gave me a Rolex, which was a gift for my first tour. Barry told me that it was a promotional tour. And though I was not going to get paid, every radio station in every city I performed in was going to play my record all day while I was in a city. And Barry told me that was major and it was going to sell a lot of records for me. And I was so excited about my first major tour and going from city to city and having the radio stations in all those cities play my records. I didn't know what to do, but it was a real dream come true for me because I knew I had it in me to make it to the arena stage. I knew I had put in the work. So once the tour started, it was a success. Shows were sold out everywhere. And then there was a couple of times I came to the show late and because I wasn't getting paid, I didn't think it was such a big deal. Until one night I showed up late for the show and after the show was over, I was in my dressing room and I had heard a commotion going on outside my door with my security and someone else. And when I went to the door and opened it, there was two guys that I never seen before standing there arguing with my security. But when they saw me, they calmed down. And the guys asked me if they could have a few minutes of my time. And because they were very respectful, and because they were very respectful, I let the security bring them into my dressing room where I asked the two guys what was going on. And one of them started telling me that a couple of times I came late to the show and ended up performing 20 minutes past 11 o'clock p.m. at night, which was 20 minutes past the time I was supposed to end the show. And when that happens, the venue charges them 25000 for overtime. And I asked the guys, who were they? They said they were the promoters of the tour. I was kind of confused, but I told them, I would try to be on time, but because I wasn't getting paid to do the tour, I didn't see that as a big of a deal that I was late a couple of times. And then one of the promoters said to me, what do you mean you're not getting paid? We gave Barry Hankinson $6 million to do this tour, R. Kelly. And I felt my heart had stopped. And I was trying to figure out what was going on because Barry told me the reason why I wasn't getting paid is because it was a promotional tour. And now, here are two guys in my dressing room telling me that they are promoters of this tour. And that they gave my manager, Barry Hankinson, $6 million for me to do this tour. And I remember looking at the Rolex that Barry had given me and saying to myself, I may not know watches or big time name brands, but I know damn well this motherfucker don't cost no $6 million. Excuse my language, but then I asked the promoter, was this a promotional tour? Because that's what Barry Hankinson told me. And the promoters were like, hell no. This ain't no motherfucking promotional tour. You might need to take that up with your manager, but we paid him $6 million for you to do this tour. And I just did not know at that point what to do, what to think, or who to even talk to about what I just heard. I was stuck because I knew that I could not read, write, or spell and was definitely not good at math. I felt like I had instantly became a blind man standing in the middle of a highway because Barry Hankinson had been 
the one person I trusted with managing my career. He had the contacts to everyone, and I thought I was the famous one. I had no clue of how the business worked, and I had no contacts to anyone because Barry always kept me out of the reach of people like the promoters and the record companies and hire people in the industry. And I also knew how Barry Hankerson would always use fair tactics to get me to stay in line and do everything he said. Things like he would always tell me to go to the movies or to go play basketball because they just took a guy down in his basement and they are about to teach his ass a lesson. I would never ask questions. I would just leave because I hated being around that kind of atmosphere. But I just continue thinking to myself, how do I get out from under Barry's shadow? Because I had heard him say many times how if anyone tried to leave him, he would ruin their life and their careers. And because of that, I knew I had to be smart and most of all patient on how I played things because I had just written a song for Michael Jackson's Space Jam movie, and the song was called I Believe I Can Fly. And if I had brought up the $6 million that Barry got paid from the promoters, I know for a fact that Barry would have snapped and went off on me and tried to intimidate me, but I would have fucked him up. Excuse my language, but I really would have. But afterwards, he would have been fired but kept that $6 million. And all of the connections right along with the Michael Jackson people who I had done, I believe I could fly for. And by me knowing in my heart that I can believe I can fly was going to be one of the biggest songs of my career, I decided not to even bring up the $6 million, but said to myself that when I believe I can fly come out, it's going to take my career to another level that I was going to let Barry Hankerson go. And the change for me came to get away from Barry when he came to Chicago to meet with me. Barry came to the studio and we sat down in the studio lounge and Barry Hankerson began telling me that he had a couple of new producers and artists. And their names were Timberland and Genuine and he wanted me to start right away working with them. And I asked him, working how? And Barry said, I needed to start collaborating and writing with them. And right away, I disagreed. I told Barry that I did not want to start writing with other writers because I still hear a whole entire songs in my head and didn't need at this point in my career to start collaborating with other writers. And Barry got mad and started saying things like, you don't listen, R&B music is dead and it's not going to sell anymore. And after he said that, I totally disagree with him. And then Barry told me that he was starting his own, his new label and it's called Black Ground Records. And I needed to get on board because my music was not going to sell unless I worked with his new artist, Genuine, and the producer Timberland. And I told Barry that I had nothing against his new artist and producer, but I still believed in my writing skills and also my producing skills and was going to continue and I was going to continue writing and producing my own music. I remember Barry telling me that I was a fool and that R&B music is going nowhere. And I said to Barry, yes, it is. Then Barry said to me, OK, Mr. Know-it-all, where is R&B going? And I said to Barry, R&B is going wherever the hell I lead it. Then I told him, and since you don't believe in me and you have new writers, artists, and producers, and also a record label, then it's clear to me that it's time for me to move on. That's when Barry really started going off and yelling that nobody leaves me without some type of consequences. And when he said that, me and my cousin Black, who was with me at the moment, we all started fighting because my cousin was more of a street guy than I am. But because Barry threatened me, before I knew it, I was swinging as Barry was swinging and also Blackie. It all lasted every bit of 35 seconds. And then I told Barry, 
that his fear tactics don't work no more and to get the hell out of my studio. And I'll never forget it. Barry smiled at me and said I was going down if it takes the rest of his life and then said he'll be back tomorrow. I never saw Barry Hankerson again. And the next album I put out that I had wrote and produced by myself was called TP2.com. And it went seven times platinum, which proved to myself and Barry that R&B was still very much alive and still selling. And after Barry saw that, I was still the number one R&B artist and my records were selling more than ever without him. He decided to have someone from New York to call my phone, which was another one of his fear tactics. So when I answered it, it was one of Barry Street guys who was very, very known because I knew exactly who he was when he said his name. He said to me that he's going to be in Chicago the next day to see me and it would be beneficial to me and everybody involved if I complied with these things he he wants to say to me. And rather me running from something that was invisible, I decided to meet with this guy. So I let my cousin know what was going on, and he and I decided that we would love to be prepared for whatever when Barry's guy showed up to my studio, and which was right in the middle of Cabrini Green, which was one of the most dangerous projects in Chicago and we and where I used to live. So me and my cousin recruited a couple of street friends that we were still cool with. And they brought my and they brought those friends from Cabrini Green Projects. And it was about 60 cars in the parking lot of nothing but project guys and those girls. And they were girls. And they were guys placed all over the, the halls, all over my studio. They were legally strapped with their weapons showing, leading all the way up the stairs to where I was in the studio. Now, this is not at my now, this is not my everyday life, but I knew who was on that phone talking to me. And I had a clear understanding of what they meant when they said it would be beneficial to me to meet with them. And besides, I know how Barry Hankerson played. So I had to set a tone and send a message to at least let the guy know that I was protected and that things were not sweet. And I also needed him to go back and tell Barry what he seen. So when he arrived at the gate, he arrived in three black SUVs that were tinted. They pulled into the gate and all of the doors opened and they were about 10 or 11 guys and they got out of the SUVs and one of them grabbed a wheelchair from the back of the SUV and brought it around the back to the front of it. And I was watching all of this on the camera they take him out of the back of the SUV, place him in a wheelchair, and wheelchair him into my studio. And after rolling past all the strapped guys going to the elevator, coming up to my studio, when they rolled him into the room, the first thing he said to me is, damn, Kels, I thought I was coming into the, the White House or something. And I told him, in the middle of the projects, of the projects where I grew up at, and though I love to be around my people, that I grew up with don't mean I trust everybody. I'm sure you know how it is. Look at you. You all armed up and we both laughed it off. I offered him a drink and as we sipped on some Hennessy, he said he was going to get straight to it. He said to me that he know that me and Barry are not together and don't see eye to eye anymore. But Barry wants to give me another chance to reconsider the decision I made as far as leaving him. And I said to the guy, Barry wants me to give him another chance to reconsider? Then I said, listen, listen, man, I know who you are and I respect who you are. And then I started telling him everything that Barry had done to me and everything that he had took from me. And by the time I got telling this guy about Barry Hankinson and the millions of dollars that he had stolen from me, 
it left the guy no choice but to agree with me as to why I would not be taking Barry up on his so-called offer. And when the guy asked me if I was 100% sure that I didn't want to reconsider, I told him no. I was 100% sure that I would not be reconsidering. He took a deep breath, took his last shot of Hennessy, and said he would be relaying the message to Barry. And then he laughed and asked me, would they be getting, uh, and then he asked me, would they be getting their armor back? And I just laughed it off and said, come on, man. Hell yeah, I'm not like that. We shook hands and we took a picture together and he left. And I never seen him again. And after they left, I just fell on the floor in a big, gigantic sigh of relief because I have never done anything even close to that in my life. I was very paranoid after that night and I had to up my security and start taking the security part of my life way more serious. Next page to start is the public's eye and how the prosecutors use them. We here now. I was pushing the act. Uh huh. Damn, I wish I was pushing the act. Uh huh. Damn, I wish I was pushing the act. Uh huh. I had no haps if I was pushing the act. Damn. 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 I wish I was pushing the act.